Whether you're on the 2D workflow or the 3D workflow, the first thing you have to do is you get a new set of data, you've got to find out what's changed. Uh, and a lot of uh, design partners are great at documenting that, and a lot of them are. So either you know which one you're dealing with, or you're going to try and do a little extra diligence to determine what's changed about it. After you've determined what's changed, if it's 2D data, somebody's got to create a model. If it's 3D design data, somebody's got to create what we call a construction model or a coordination model from that. And that's where you know the means and methods of construction come in. Um, I'm not one to fault the design team for not including those. I think it's outside their scope. So I've always viewed it as, you know, if the design team can give you a head start, great, take it. But you, you need a, a construction model, and there are differences. I've seen, um, talked to a couple authors lately who are writing books on the difference between a 3D design model and a 3D construction model. I was delighted to see that. It's, so it's not going to come from a vendor, a vendor like us and sound biased. It's going to come from outside experts, and I, I think the industry will, will really benefit from that. The people who've been through this 20 times already know the differences, but if you haven't, uh, there will be some independent reading available soon on this topic. That's the construction model. What is so interesting about this, this is a really good thing, uh, is there's really no 2D equivalent, and so it's pretty easy to get excited about, you know, this is where all the coordination is happening, and this was the low-hanging fruit when BIM found its way into the construction side of this equation. For good reason, there's a lot of opportunity to avoid errors here, save costs, and deliver a new experience for the owner and the, and the construction team. So on both workflows, the next step usually would be whether it's using on-screen takeoff or some other technology on the 2D side, uh, or using model takeoff techniques uh, down below on the 3D side. The next step is not uh, a change in the data set, but an extraction of data from it called quantities. That's a key thing for you guys. I think it's really, if you were to map out your business as a computer scientist would and, and build an information language around your business, quantities is one of the key pivot points of, of running a project successfully. So, And having a, a handle on those quantities as things change and move around over time uh, is therefore really key. Our customers, constructor customers in the past and soon to be uh, Vico Office customers. We haven't quite enabled this yet for the Vico Office clients, but we're about to. Uh, but certainly constructor customers have been doing this way. Go to a, an extra step. They have what we call a location breakdown structure. It's a work breakdown, and that now has created a new kind of data set. So we've climbed up to a new branch on the information tree that I call a zoned model. I was tempted to call that a 4D model, but the 4D word in the industry has kind of been co-opted to mean something different. It, it kind of you know, means a sequenced animation movie, and that's not what we mean here. What this is is uh, naturally, let's think of a, it's an eight-story commercial project with you know an east wing and a west wing, and so it's subdivided maybe into 16 or 17 zones where there might be zone one is the site, and and then the next 16 zones are first floor east wing, second floor east wing, second floor. Uh, second, first floor, west wing, and then the east and west of the second, east and west of the third, and that type of thing. If you zone the project like that, that's actually how people are going to schedule it. You're going to schedule form work for east wing, you know, of level four uh, as one task. You don't schedule each column. And uh, those zones kind of have a big impact then on how many materials did need to be delivered to site on what date. So now you have derived location-based quantities. I know how much sheetrock is going into the east wing of the fourth floor. I can therefore stage procurement, for example, uh, accordingly. Um, the next step that our customers go through then is uh, getting ready for um, their cost estimating. Now on the 2D product line, that's linking those quantities to a cost estimating database. On the 3D line, we actually link them to this thing we call a 5D library. It's got the cost and assembly type of information you're used to in estimating, but it has other information that is uh, uh, task duration specific in nature. And um, allow, you'll see what that allows in just a minute. But it, we're going one jump up the information branch now to, uh, if you're a 2D guy, you've now got enough information to generate a cost estimate. If you're a BIM guy, you've got cost derived from a, from a 3D model, 3D construction model. The next step in 2D is to prepare a schedule. So that's 
usually an independent and unconnected task. Um, and the next step in the 5D BIM workflow is to derive a flow line schedule from exactly the same model data and 5D library uh, parameters. So this is the, you see my blue uh, pen on the right, this is the 5D BIM line we keep talking about. And this is how our customers usually get to it. More often than not, there isn't a 3D model from the design team yet. Uh, and we do see that changing. The trend's kind of going toward more often that it is. But way past 50% of the time, there's not. And so somebody's looking at 2D data, determining changes, creating a model that is the construction model, then adding locations to it, deriving quantities, linking it to their 5D library, which you can have a 5D master library and then make uh, variations of that per project, or you could use the last one that you had on the last project and use it on this project, uh, and deriving costs and schedules. It's a highly productive, highly repetitive, uh, repeatable, rather, process. And what's exciting to me about it, I watched this happen in the manufacturing industry 20 years ago, is when something changes, you go back to the beginning of this loop and you replay it. But you don't have to redefine the location structure. Those location structures are a persistent piece of data in the, the VECO constructor and VECO office databases. You don't have to redefine the 5D library. That's, that's there. It's ready to be used on this project or the next one. So you go back and based on those changes, you modify your model and you replay quantities and derived cost and derived schedule. And that's why you can turn this around so quickly. Uh, you're using uh, the model data, and this, it just turns out to be a great handle for us, a uh, fantastic filing cabinet that, you know, we've added uh, more space to the, uh, the second story subgrade parking lot and parking garage, and that's going to flow right into an impact on cost and schedule. Okay? Now, it's not as simple as clicking a button, so I'm not pretending that it's that simple, uh, but it is this automated, it is this path uh, that, that most of our users are, are using to take it, and um, it is this repeatable in terms of turning answers around in a short time, sitting in front of the owner and the design team and showing them the impact that this has on, on the design. 